I think then in terms of welcomes, um, that covers most of the things. Um, I think we have Marilyn minute taking along with Katie. Um, have I failed to welcome anybody who's here and I needed to welcome? And I apologise in advance if I have done, but please identify yourself if I have. It uh, looks as though um, my brief from Neil uh, is, is full then. Um, in terms of declarations of interests, um, Anne, I'm sure, makes the usual declaration. She's uh, nodding at me uh, in relation to the trusteeship of the Oxford Hospitals charity. Um, I know uh, that everybody will have refreshed their declarations of interest as part of the uh, annual process. Um, and Ash, I think you will have filled one in, but is there anything given that we don't know you that you just want to draw to our attention as uh, of interest that you just want to make sure colleagues are aware? Not that I'm aware of uh, on today's meeting. Um, obviously, I have a role in NHS England, but it doesn't affect this area. Thank you. Uh, and as we all get the chance to get to know Ash better, we'll discover he has many interests, but not many that conflict with uh, what we're dealing with. Um, thank you. Um, I think then that takes us to the, the minutes of our March meeting um, and Neil has spotted or someone has spotted and drawn to Neil's attention uh, in paragraph 37, uh, a misspelling of device for device. Um, so we have device at present and we should have device. Um, so congratulations to whoever spotted um, that. But I'm not aware of any other corrections required for our 10th of March meeting. Um, are there any others that we need to make? No, so uh, thank you very much. I, we'll have to uh, suggest that Neil puts one of those in for all of the uh, meetings. So Marilyn, if you could spot a, uh, you know, a, an Americanization or a verb to noun spelling, you'll tell whether we've uh, looked at the minutes um, correctly. Uh, so uh, very unusually, um, there are no action log uh, open items for us uh, today. Um, we did have uh, an issue from the March meeting around trainee feedback, but that comes up, I think, when we get to the Safe Working Hours Guardians report. And Megan, is that right? So uh, yeah, sure. uh, we will pick up that the maternity issue has been addressed um, for, from that point. So I don't believe that there are any matters arising from uh, the previous minutes, but I may be wrong. Has anybody got anything we need to flag up? Thank you. Um, just in terms of uh, my business, um, Neil hadn't fed anything to me, but I think there are three things I just want to, uh, to mention. Um, one is, of course, we're delighted to have Ash with us. We do, as I think people know, have a second non-executive director appointment in train, uh, and we now know that all the various bits of paper work are, are sorted and we hope that she will be with us for our next meeting and we'll make a formal announcement once the uh, materials are put together. So we hope that will be very shortly. Um, secondly, uh, you will know that the Queen's speech yesterday included the commitment to the legislation for NHS reform. Um, as far as I'm aware, it wasn't there when I had looked last night, so we don't know the details yet, but that clearly will have a significant impact on uh, our uh, governance and activity going forward um, and we will keep colleagues at the board and also the Council of Governors briefed on that as more details emerge. I'd just like to observe that um, the way the NHS works um, is that you don't wait for the legislation to be agreed. We have a government with a majority and everybody is already working full pelt on implementing the legislation that's not even published in draft form yet. Um, so it is likely to move quite fast and we should just acknowledge that that is part of the difficult environment that our colleagues um, on the executive side are working on. And the third thing under Chair's business um, uh, just want to, to clarify our thinking about returning to some site visits. So NED colleagues will have had an email around the opportunity to join Bruno uh, on a number of visits. We're quite keen that we don't suddenly swamp our clinical areas with uh, lots of uh, people being present when we move from a situation where we've been very careful about people coming in. And hence the sort of step that we're thinking initially we have a group of us joining so that we're able to 
get our feedback and get to meet people, but we we don't go wholesale into uh, walking the boards towards in the way that we would have done in previous uh, times. So uh, Bruno, Sam and I had a walk around the Horton uh, and the Ramsey Centre at, um, at the Horton uh, on Friday and an opportunity for people to begin to uh, join some of those visits and then we will get back to a more normal visiting process in, in due course. But I think we need to do that in a planned and controlled way and that's why and Ned colleagues have had that email um, around. Um, I think that's all I have from Chair's business. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to Bruno to do the Chief Executive's report, uh, and then we can pick up questions and comments on those two things together um, as appropriate. Bruno. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. And as usual, things are moving very fast. So when we submitted the chief executive report lots of new things have happened so what i'll do is uh, give maybe an update on the the more recent uh, events and then uh, highlight the most important uh, points that were listed in the chief executive's report you already mentioned that we walked the the horton uh, wards and, and and the ramsey and you'll recall uh, chair that staff were very proud on friday that they had no COVID patients um, being admitted to the hospital or in the hospital uh, on Friday. And then over the weekend, we achieved another milestone with no COVID patients at all across the trust. And uh, we've um, uh, even today have no COVID patients. A word of caveat, we do expect uh, some more COVID patients to come back into the hospital but it shows that we have reached another milestone in the fight against the pandemic with a COVID-free hospital for the first time since we first admitted a patient. So um, I can tell you that when we met staff on Friday, they were very pleased with that at the Horton. But when Terry and I um, walked uh, the John Radcliffe uh, yesterday, a similar response was there. People are very relieved that um, we're entering a new phase into the pandemic uh, response. Infection rates are also uh, quite low in Oxfordshire and around. Of course, we all uh, follow the news. Uh, there's still concerns about the variants, but um, we're in a much better place than when the last time uh, we met as a, as a board. So I think that is, um, that is some uh, positive news to start this meeting with. Um, when uh, board members will talk to staff, you'll notice that um, some staff are still pretty almost traumatized by the experience. Um, this has been a very, very difficult period for uh, many of us. And so Terry and I met some services where people literally were uh, deployed to a different service on a day by day basis. They came in in the morning and uh, figured out via WhatsApp what service they would join that day. So fortunately, we're coming out of that difficult uh, period, but um, we have to remind ourselves that uh, this has been a very challenging period for many staff members. And we keep supporting them um, uh, throughout this um, sort of uh, period with, um, with health and well-being sessions, uh, psychological support, to make sure that they can uh, recover and, as we said last time, grow stronger out of this pretty traumatic uh, experience uh, for all of us. Um, we were also um, uh, happy to um, welcome CQC inspectors um, on uh, May the 5th uh, after they had already interviewed our senior leaders and the infection prevention and control team uh, before the um, unannounced visit, uh, I briefed the board um, on the day on the verbal feedback that we had received from the uh, CQC inspectors. But uh, yesterday we received a letter, a very short letter with um, some of the same uh, content, but it does state that at the first opportunity, uh, we should discuss this letter at the public board. So hence, I'm giving a verbal update of the of the letter. Uh, but um, we will, of course, uh, receive a full report and um, be able to uh, 
spent more time reviewing the report and making sure that we take all of the recommendations uh, into into consideration. If I can start with uh, with the positive news, which is in line with uh, the verbal update that we shared on the on May the fifth. Um, the inspectors observed very good hand hygiene and wearing of the uh, personal protective equipment, the PPE. And I can confirm that. I mean, lots of us and other senior leaders have been doing walk arounds throughout the pandemic. And uh, we're very pleased to see indeed that our staff uh, is uh, very careful, wears PPE, uh, does the hand hygiene, the, the seven steps are all followed. And it sort of amuses me when I walk around and there's a staff member that may have the mask slightly sort of at the borderline of the nose, they immediately sort of make sure that it's correctly positioned. So they're very much aware of this. And it's also good to see that uh, the inspectors um, have confirmed that during their unannounced uh, visit. Uh, staff have told the inspectors that the IPC team, Infection Prevention Control Team, is very uh, visible and very helpful. Uh, those are the words in the letter. If I can add to that uh, a, a sense of uh, real gratitude to the expertise that that team brought uh, during uh, the past uh, months, but also still now, um, the board will know that they were leading the way on staff testing. They were uh, leading the way on um, sort of making sure that we uh, we had the right PPE uh, equipment uh, at the right time uh, in every part of the trust. Um, so we are extremely happy that we have such a strong team and at least staff also confirmed you know, that they were very visible and helpful uh, to support them to keep safe during uh, the pandemic. And also staff felt well supported with respect to the infection prevention by the senior leaders, which is good to um, see that is uh, people on this call, but also uh, a lot of our divisional leadership and other senior leaders uh, in the trust, which is uh, good. So far, the positive uh, feedback, of course, when uh, people come and inspect, there's also some uh, improvement points. Uh, the first one that was listed was around the signage around the hospital where the inspectors um, said it was not always very clear in helping patients, visitors and staff navigate uh, the hospital in a, in a safe way. Uh, we do have the signs about the physical distancing and signs about the um, hand hygiene and, and the wearing of PPE, but it's more the signs on the floor, what direction you, know, you should travel, the one-way systems. And, and uh, so that was the signage. Uh, second point was around the cleaning uh, schedules uh, which were not uh, visible in uh, the rooms that they inspected and therefore they could not be assured yeah, that uh, the cleaning frequency was as uh, as stated in our policy. And then uh, finally there were uh, two remarks on sharp bins um, which were in non-clinical areas and they're not supposed to be there, they're only supposed to be in clinical areas. And also uh, they noticed a lack of adequate uh, storage space and observed that some boxes were actually there for sitting on the floor, which again is an improvement uh, area for the trust. So I think uh, overall um, we were very pleased with the, the positive points that were highlighted. Um, I think it is quite good to see that an independent body uh, sort of confirms what we felt all along that we had sufficient PPE, sufficient support for staff to keep safe and keep our patients uh, safe. And um, uh, management is already acting upon the improvement points around storage and um, the, the, the signage um, and the cleaning schedules, which we will, of course, update the board um, in due course. So that's the uh, CQC visit. And I thought of just giving the update during my chief executive's uh, report. Um, moving to the report, a couple of highlights uh, maybe to um, to come to. Um, first of all, um, we have some new estate in use that will help us with any subsequent waves in the pandemic. So level five at the John Radcliffe 
the new respiratory unit um, has opened. And as the board will know, these are single rooms, well ventilated, which could be um, used by um, uh, COVID patients or any other infectious uh, diseases. Uh, in addition to, of course, the infectious disease unit, we have the John Waring Ward. So this is additional capacity, well suited for uh, infectious uh, diseases such as COVID. Um, and if you have been on the John Radcliffe site or uh, followed me on Twitter yesterday, you will have seen that the critical care building um, has now three levels already installed, uh, two more to go. Uh, but we're on track to having a, um, a very beautiful estate in terms of critical care that again will be ready for any future searches that we may see um, in autumn or winter if uh, there would be further waves of, um, of COVID uh, infections. Um, we'll talk a bit later about the, um, the planning um, guidance that was submitted by NHS England and how we're responding. Um, so I'm going to uh, not go into a lot of detail there because we'll have uh, an update uh, later in the board uh, session. Um, and the rest of the report again highlights some amazing, amazing achievements. It's going to take too long to list them all uh, in my verbal uh, update. Um, but the Horton again uh, was a prize winner around the hip replacement. Uh, we had some fantastic studies being published by our researchers and clinicians around uh, the impact of vaccinations, uh, around testing, um, some new vaccine developments, not just for COVID, but for malaria. So a tremendous um, success in terms of uh, scientific impact that's listed in the report, which is quite important because we're now submitting our next BRC bit um, for the next five years. And uh, that is going to be quite important to be able to sustain the excellence in, um, in innovation, uh, research and innovation that we have demonstrated in the past five years and certainly in the past year. Uh, lots of uh, residents in Oxfordshire in the country and worldwide have benefited from the investment that was made in our uh, research uh, capabilities. That concludes my update, Jonathan, but happy to take any questions. Thanks, Bruno. Um, I just want to check that everybody received a copy of the letter that we received from the CQC, which um, I, I, mean, I think circulated yesterday so that people have access to that. Um, and I think we probably shouldn't leave this section without noting the update in relation to Ariel uh, Nanada, who was not only shortlisted, but was the co-winner of the Bain Nurse of the Year Award. So everyone probably knows that already from the, the publicity, but we probably should put that on the record as an update. Uh, and I now have, that's given time for Katie and Claire to raise hands. Katie first. Thank you very much, Chair. And Bruno, it's, it's it's so lovely to hear a positive report. Um, we've had a lot of difficulty and I congratulate you and your teams for coming through a lot of that. Um, I just have one question, which um, it's, it's to do with the critical care building, it's to do with the respiratory rooms. Can you give a figure of how many more beds in total we will have at the end of this exercise compared to the baseline of where we were say at the beginning of last year? It's a good question Katie and uh, I can't give the answer now because we're in discussions with the ICS and the region on how many capacity we will start um, going forward because there's a difference between physical space and then uh, making sure that we have enough uh, what is called revenue allocation to be able to uh, staff the capacity that we um, potentially could staff uh, because we have the room uh, available. Uh, especially the critical care is a significant expansion, it's 48 beds. Um, I don't think we'll staff all of that, um, but that's still, it's called the business case in development and in discussion with the region. And then in terms of the bed capacity, again, that is a discussion that we're having with the, uh, with the ICS. Uh, not just in terms of bed capacity, but also theatre capacity, diagnostic uh, capacity. It's all what we call capacity planning and see how we allocate that capacity to the demand that we're expecting. We know some demand because it's on the waiting list, but we're also trying to predict 
what additional demand may come on the waiting list or will um, be referred in uh, sort of urgent uh, emergency cases. And, and that is part of the planning that's still ongoing. Thanks, Katie. Clearly a good question um, and something we'll need to find a way of getting our hand around the ICS planning, because obviously we've been able to look at our own end of that. But as the ICS matures in its planning processes, we'll want to make sure we get a site, good sightline on that at this board. Claire. Thank, thank you, Jonathan. Um, Bruno, fantastic news about the Horton hip fracture team. That's brilliant. I just wanted to understand sort of where we were on hip fracture across the rest of OUH and really understand whether we were looking at best practice at the Horton uh, so that we could learn from it elsewhere. Sarah, do you want to come in on, on that question or Megna, do you want to come in? Megna's fastest finger. Who wants to? Yeah. Megna, do you want to go first? Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Bruno. Um, so, Claire, absolutely. Um, the Horton perform in terms of performance for National Hip Fracture Database. The Horton performs um, much better than at the John Radcliffe. We put in we put in a series of actions at the John Radcliffe um, when we reviewed what the issues with the pathway were for fracture neck or femur patients. Um, and it often was the time between admission or arrival in ED to going to theatre and going to the ward. So we've tried to uh, minimise that time. We've tried. We've also made sure that analgesia is offered while in ED uh, to make sure the quality of care is improved. Uh, our numbers have steadily improved in the last 18 months uh, in terms of performance. Uh, at the John Radcliffe, uh, and we did actually have the both the teams come together, the John Radcliffe and the Horton teams, to understand what it was it what what it was at the Horton that was so dr different, and and they clearly have a process at the Horton of uh, absolutely daily MDT within within the within those uh, patient group uh, between geriatrics, so also geriatrics and the trauma team, uh, multidisciplinary meeting which is very beneficial. Um, so we, we, we've, we've done all that and, and the work is in progress. It will continue. Uh, there's also a, 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 um, a plan, if I can call it that, to make sure that uh, because of the pressures on our ED, to make sure that patients from the north of the county are taken to the Horton uh, if they have a fractured neck or femur, um, particularly in times when times are pressured. Sarah, did you want to add to that? Megan, I just added what I was going to add. Thank you, Chair. That's fine. Um, uh, Ash, I saw your hand go up earlier, but it's gone down again. Is, is that because what yeah. you raised has been covered? Yeah, sorry. It was it was actually the fact I had, hadn't seen the letter, but then I realised it came in very late last night and I hadn't picked it up yet, yeah. but I found it. <laughs> it is, yeah, it did come very late last night. For, so, uh, uh, Anne. OK, so I just wanted to pick up on the uh, CQC visit. So um, it's encouraging to to hear that that went quite well. Um, or, re you know, it sounds like it went well. Obviously, it's early days in terms of the findings, but the in initial findings are encouraging. And I'm pleased to hear that we've got um, sort of actions underway to deal with some of those issues. I guess some of those issues that they raised are issues that some of them have, we've been aware of for a while, like the signage. I know that's an ongoing issue and storage is another ongoing issue, which um, we see a lot of evidence of when we walk around um, the hospital. Um, so I'm pleased to hear that we're sort of on our way in addressing those issues. Clearly, we need to wait for the final report from CQC and there may well be other things um, that we need to take account of. But it's encouraging to see that um, that, that you know that that was a positive visit. Um, so thank you to everyone who was involved in that because I know it's always a very stressful time when the CQC um, announced that they're going to arrive and inspect us, particularly when we're everybody is very stressed uh, following COVID. So just wanted to say that. Thank you. And I think the fact that there are no real surprises there means that we can expect as a board to see the action plans reasonably worked out by the time we get formal report because we know what's going on. But I'm going to be disabused of that expectation by Sam and Eileen if necessary. Sam first. Um, just wanted to share just some early thoughts from the Why Do It Zec on two of the key points and maybe bring in David if I can. Um, so just I've just closed my consultation just 
following the, the new portfolio that I took up in September. Um, and part of that plan is quite a significant change around how we manage soft FM, including a proposal to put a very senior nurse into that team, because as Anne will say, whether it's place or line of sight of cleaning standards, that's an area that we really need to strengthen. So that's something that we're progressing at the moment. The other piece that I just wanted to flag in terms of signage um, is we'd like to do a really large piece of work on this. Um, and maybe I won't steal David's thunder, but maybe if David wants to share a couple of thoughts around the digital options for that. Um, but certainly hard signs, um, that's a, a really big piece of work that, that Bruno has been encouraging us to, to look at. So rather than sort of pop some extra signs up and, and tick an action plan, I think it's, it's quite a big piece of work that we'd like to do. And I'd really appreciate David maybe just adding a couple of points in as well. So David, take that invitation and I'll go to Eileen. Um, yeah, I think there's a, there's a significant opportunity to, to look at this and there's, I think we need to wrap two um, processes into one though, because there's the, the question with regards to signage, which I think there are digital solutions out there which we should be exploring, which will allow a lot more flexibility also with future configuration of a state, because the issue with um, traditional signage is of course they always need to, to move when we reconfigure. But also I think there's an opportunity for us to look at um, developing better wayfinding solutions, um, not only just for our patients, but actually for our staff. Um, I still remember my first walk around the Radcliffe um, and getting significantly lost. So I think any wayfinding solutions that we can develop as part of that would also be very welcome. So I look forward to working with Sam and the, the teams on developing those options. Thanks, David. Eileen? Thank you, Chair. So just building on that, um, and that, that work would be really welcomed. In terms of this inspection, this just to put it in context for other colleagues joining us on the call. This was part of a national programme of very focused inspections that's going on right across the, the NHS in England. And, um, and as such, then they came specifically to look at things in terms of the infection prevention and control. So the comments in relation to signage really predominantly in this way related to the points about the wayfinding during the pandemic. So the one way systems and what that might feel like for people who had come to the hospital before being familiar with a particular route and now found themselves being diverted elsewhere. Um, in relation to the cleaning as well, um, we, we absolutely take in point the points about needing to display the cleaning schedules, although CQC did acknowledge that the facilities were clean. So just to reassure um, colleagues, it wasn't that they weren't clean, it was the absence of being able to see the visual reminder of when they had been cleaned. Um, also as well, um, CQC mentioned about the visibility and the, the IPC team, which Bruno brought attention to. And with a, a, a Bruno's close eye on the health and well-being of staff, he personally wrote to everybody that night after the inspection to say thank you on behalf of the board and particularly to uh, Dr Katie Jeffries and Lisa Butcher who are the infection prevention control leads on both the medical and nursing side who've done a stellar job but also the wider team and I think that was really appreciated by staff because they have made an absolutely outstanding effort and the fact that Bruno wrote personally I think was very well received. In terms of next steps we've already started taking the actions. So the, the space group during COVID pandemic has already started looking at the signage. The team have already started looking at the storage, et cetera. And CQC did acknowledge that on all their inspections, they're finding the storage to be a universal problem in all of the inspections because of the volume of PPE, all the additional kit that we have to carry during the COVID has challenged us. But notwithstanding that, storage is always an issue. In terms of next steps, in addition to the actions we've already put in train, we are briefing tomorrow in our trust-wide staff briefing at 8.30. We will brief the organisation on the findings of the inspection. Then in the afternoon at our trust management executive, we will be discussing the steps and the actions that we need to take in any intermediate situation now whilst we await the final report. I think from the point of view of all of the inspections that we are subjected through through the pandemic, we have been very pleased with the outcome of this one so far. And I think given the fact that it is important that we celebrate the positives, I think it's a powerful message back to the staff that their absolute 100% compliance with, H, with hand hygiene and PPE was observed, acknowledged by the inspection team. And I think that's quite a challenge in the environment in which our colleagues are operating. Thanks, Eileen. I um, reiterate that and, and 
bearing in mind that both the signage uh, issues and the cleaning issues were around the confidence of people finding their way around and knowing that they were safe as opposed to whether they were let's say I think that's important. Um, Bruno, I hope this probably should be the last word on this bit, shouldn't it? Um, and then we'll move back to the agenda because we've taken longer on this than we would have done had the CQC not written to you on Monday. Um, uh, and uh, this is clearly important, but I'm much encouraged by the fact that we're learning how to improve the whole trust and not merely producing an action plan that ticks off the response to the letter. That's really important. Bruno. I just want to take the opportunity. Last board meeting, we talked about the um, uh, ability to rest, reflect and recover. I can tell you that the executive team has rested and reflected, but that was a short period of resting and reflection. So we're in full swing again. And I just want to thank my executive colleagues for uh, all of the, again, hard work that happened in between the two public board meetings, because we have thanked the infection prevention and control team and the divisional teams. But I think it's appropriate that we also thank the executive colleagues for a, a tremendous job. Absolutely, Bruno, thank you. And I can see nods from my non-executive colleagues. Um, the executives are trying not to nod, although they are supporting each other. They don't think it's good form to nod when that's said. Thank they're, you. They're smiling, Jonathan, which is good. <laughs> um, smiling is very good, given the uh, uh, the amount of work that is going on. That's great. So thank you very much, everybody, for, um, for that. Uh, as always, the Chief Executive's report just shows how much stuff uh, is going on in the Trust and it's our opportunity to set the scene for what usually then focuses on things that are more challenging as we move into the uh, agenda. We also want to set the scene in terms of uh, why we are here in terms of delivering high quality, um, compassionate, excellent care um, to people. And the next item is the patient perspective item. And in this case, we are looking at learning from a serious incident um, that required review and Sam can I hand over to you. Thank you chairman. Um, so just to open this this item we've been reviewing tissue damage um, via the IPR for a couple of years now um, and a theme of the questions I was reflecting that we've discussed not only includes our position as a trust but more importantly the learning um, opportunities that we have for improvement. Um, I've also appended a paper as part of this paper, um, a paper that Megan and I considered as part of the Clinical Governance Committee, um, which has got more detail concerning the arrangements for monitoring and oversight and closure, um, and also some of the improvement work um, that we've been undertaking to reduce overall incidents. So the purpose of this paper is to demonstrate the learning from previous practice and, and hopefully exemplify how, we, how the change can be implemented. Um, I've got Louise Johnson, who's one of our Deputy Directors of Nursing from the Division. I think she's got a number of colleagues from the ward where the patient was cared for on this call who are very happy to um, take questions. In fact, very proud of the improvements that they've made. So the story focuses on a patient who we cared for in June 2020, who was reported to have been discharged home with multiple areas of significant hospital acquired pressure ulceration. Um, and this also triggered a safeguarding referral. In response to this, the ward team, alongside their divisional senior nurses, identified areas of practice that required improvement and subsequent changes to help prevent recurrence. So it really combines the learning and reflections of the nursing and podiatry teams in this case, um, while supporting this gentleman who was acutely unwell and frail in his 80s. Since June 2020, the clinical team that have joined me today have demonstrated huge amount of ongoing learning and change culture. And this has really been evident in the future discussions that we've had at the harm-free reviews and any further incidences across the organisation, they've been able to share their learning. So four key areas of learning from this incident, which was in fact a serious incident investigation involving training, communication, teamwork, the use of safety huddles and also photo app. Just wanted to end by saying that the Harm Free Group is, is a really positive and collaborative group. I get such great multi-professional engagement and we've just agreed an ambition to significantly reduce our Category 2 to 4 pressure ulcers by 25% over the course of this year based on our 1920 outturn. We saw a reduction of reporting during the pandemic year, so we're going for a slightly tougher um, trajectory based on 1920. Um, and, and that's been accepted by the divisional nurses, in fact embraced, um, and it's a real drive to 
improve the reporting and care of patients who, by improving our incident reporting rate by 25% of the category one. So catching this damage earlier in a bid to prevent um, deterioration in category two to four. So I'll leave that there. And I know that the team are on the call and very happy to take any questions around the improvements that they've made. Tony. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, well, we, we, we've discussed this before in uh, in um, the board on several occasions, uh, and I'd like to take this opportunity to commend the team um, on an excellent report. Uh, this is an important area. It's it's important not in just in its own right, but as a reflection of other areas of, of activity. Uh, and I thought that this was a really very good report and the actions um, undertaken are very encouraging. And in particular, I felt that it was very helpful to have these targets of 25% reduction um, moving forward um, because this has been a stubborn area for us and, and it's not surprising. It's, it's always difficult to reduce this sort of thing, but it but it's a it's a challenge, but one worth winning. So I'm really uh, reassured and uh, very supportive of this. Um, of course, it's meant it's maintaining um, the training and uh, the actions that are put in place are the key. And I just wanted to ask a question about how, how much of the um, reorganization, if you will, of uh, pressure or some management has been bottom up um, from from the people at the at the front line in, in terms of informing how they feel um, things should be changed to improve. Thanks, Tony. Maybe if I just make a brief start, but it's probably better to hear from our frontline teams on the call. Just wanted to note, because it's not in the paper, one of the um, areas that Megan and I have worked with the teams on is the patient safety response team. So this is where um, if we have moderate harms and above or never events, we make a decision as to whether we need to go down to the ward areas and support the teams and understand a little more. Um, this is something that we've also initiated um, in response to an incident um, with a fall regarding moderate harm or above, but also um, tissue damage. And the feedback, and I'll let them speak for themselves, but the feedback of the in situ discussion with the tissue viability team and the clinical team to immediately understand and ensure that duty of candor has taken place, but immediately understand the in situ um, element of that has been really well received. And, and that's where the list of the improvements have really come from. But I'd really like Louise or colleagues to, to pick up on, on how things run in terms of bottom up. Louise. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll start and then maybe pass on to my colleagues. But um, I think it's been one of the best things we've done as a group of nurses in this organisation of shifting this and not be taking our um, tissue damage and our falls directly to Siri Forum all the time and do this visit in the ward area, which we try and do within 48 hours of the incident being reported. Obviously, since COVID, we have to move that onto teams, but it still had the same impact and effect and get to the nitty gritty with the teams of what actually caused that pressure damage, what were the contributory factors and put realistic actions into place in a timely way with um, an action plan that's completely achievable within 30 days. Um, and as other patients maybe get pressure damage after that, we've been able to build on the actions from last time and say, well, we did that last time, that worked well for this, but what can we do to build on it further and further safeguard our patients? Um, I've got Natasha Walker on the call, who is the ward sister for 6A, who was the ward sister at the time, and also Heather Talbot, who's the matron for specialist surgery. So I'm not sure if they have any other comments on their experience of the new harm-free process. Natasha or Heather, would you like to come in? You don't have to, you're not obliged. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, and just to follow on from what Louise said, like I completely agree in terms of making the actions achievable and especially go you know this um syria was throughout covid um the ward had lots of changes so it had to be really focused on what the ward needed and um if that meant changing actions um or maybe taking slightly longer so that we could achieve the actions um then that's what we did so it worked really well 
Thanks. Heather, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say, um, due to the nature of the patients on 6A, which are usually vascular patients, um, pressure ulcers aren't uncommon because, you know, they have a lot of comorbidities, these patients. And the team have worked really, really hard. Um, you know, we, we've had further category threes since then, um, thankfully no category fours, and the team have worked really hard every time, as Louise said, to build on the action plan every time to to try and safeguard the patients in the future as much as possible. And um, And they've done a really good job. They've done really well. Thank you. I'm going to pass to Paula next. I've got Paula, Sarah and then Megan are on my list. OK, thank you. Um, I guess I'm in the same place as Tony. I'd like to thank you for bringing this particular um, experience to us and the report. It's great to see this topic um, brought forward in this way and the actions. And for anybody who's cared for somebody in this situation, knows just how, how important it is. Um, my question, I think, probably is for Louise. Just to be really nice to hear how confident you are about the way we can we, we translate the learnings through these actions across our ward. So not just within the ward, which it comes through very strongly, but across our wards and across our hospital. Just to get a take from you, would be great. Sure. Um, so I think. For me, just initially within the ward, the most pleasing thing is when you look at the next incident, when you're looking at what happened, you can see the, the learning from the previous one evident. And it just puts such a smile on your face when you're reviewing that ISR and you say, oh, well, they did that really well and they built on that from last time. And what we do within the directorates and the division is share that learning at our um, directorate and divisional governance meeting and also our divisional nursing board and share that um, kind of Heather, Natasha and I have kind of talked about this incident so many times because we've shared it at so many different meetings and um, that gets shared then across the trust at um, clinical governance committee also and I've seen elements of the learning I think one of the particular things with this incident was, was how the team adopted photo app and I've seen that then replicated a few months down the line in neurosciences for example and then again, then again in trauma and trauma had a particular issue in getting to grips with the technology with photo app they're just down the corridor to 6a so we popped across and said how did you do it and that's how I've seen it be spread across thank you really good Thank you. That also asks, answers my question I had about the photo app and how we uh, built on it. So that's great. Uh, Sarah was next. Thank you. I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us today and the great work with Natasha and Heather. And particularly, I think uh, over the COVID, I was particularly focused on the COVID times and the most hard, the hardest times and challenging times you've all had. So to make such a difference for our patients is really incredible. Uh, just building on a couple of questions from t uh, Tony and, and Paula. So, Louise, you talked about it actually, you're sharing that within the division and you're mentioning your divisional colleagues. I'm sure you have, but the, obviously the learning across the wider divisions and other, um, other um, divisional nurses, has that also happened? That would be really helpful to know. And I've got a second question just on top of that. So yeah, I have talked about it. We have our monthly harm free assurance meeting with the other divisional nurses. I've talked about it a couple of times there and we share all our incidents there. And of course, there's clinical governance committee where I've also mentioned it in our divisional report there with other divisional colleagues. Um, but just I uh, wanted one thing I forgot to say about the photo app. I think that's been a game changer yeah. for us and how promptly we can image tissue damage and get it uploaded to the patient's record. It really has, rather than doing an OMI referral and waiting for the team to come up, it really has been a game changer and really good example of how we can encompass digitalisation into our patient care. Brilliant, brilliant. And before you go to your second question, Sarah, could I just ask on the back of that, can we do that outside the organisation as well? So does it help us with aftercare if we discharge patients and getting continuity through the photo app or people coming in? I mean, is, is that an opportunity for us? I think it is. I think it is. I'm not sure how we would do that, but I would definitely like to explore that. Certainly we use photos for dermatology, for patients taking their own photos for skin lesions in for sending those through from either the patients or GPs, to be fair, Chair, so as well. So, but yeah. Thank you. Your second question, Sarah. Sorry, slightly second question. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot around training of staff and teamwork. And for me, obviously, we have a, 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 a changeover of staff. And for me, it's that how do we make sure the learning and training is sustained? So if we're hearing, you know, Natasha and Heather and yourself move on, how do we know that we can make sure that it's sustainable? So this time next year, people will be, you know, we could go on to 6A or any of the wards and we know that the learning is in place. It's just, 
and that might be a bit of a longer question and what can we as a board help you with to support you in that Thank i think you. i'll pass over to natasha in a minute because what i what i saw her do is they started training each other once they'd had training from t colleagues in the tissue viability team they then adopted approach of training each other and actually natasha has since moved on from 6a and as um, she was just in a maternity to comment at the time that this happened and she's now in a permanent ward sister post on seu we've unfortunately lost her from the division but um that's how they adopted the learning in that area was to start training each other natasha was there anything else you'd like to say about that yeah, absolutely. And the use of link roles. So we really tried to get individuals really specialised in the area of tissue viability and categorisation of pressure ulcers um, so that they could then teach each other, which I think was the, you know, the best way that we could share the learning. And I think also um, we made sure the link roles were across the bands as well. So not yeah. just the sort of senior qualified nurses. We made sure we had some healthcare assistants as well who um, became link nurses and were really passionate about pressure area care so that we know that that care runs through all of the bands of nursing on the ward, um, not necessarily just the registered nurses. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to come to the board. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Megan, uh, next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Louise, thank you very much uh, for this, sharing this. Um, as you know, um, the whole ethos of the patient safety response team uh, is that it is multidisciplinary and we do see these incidents every morning. Um, so I'm really keen that when you have the meetings with the clinical teams where the patients are who have sustained moderate and above pressure tissue damage, that those meetings are multidisciplinary and involve doctors, diet dietitians and therapists as well, because it is about holistic care. Um, and I think I would really encourage you to do that. And if there's any support you need with making that happen, I'm very happy to help. Thank you, Megan. I think that's an excellent point. Um, we have, um, with this example, obviously, we, a podiatry team, were heavily involved and we have used dietitians in the past and also therapists. Um, the OTs and the physios, because they spend a large amount of time with our patients, but getting the, our medical colleagues more involved, I think, is really something that how we could take these further. Thank you. Thank you. And the last on my list is Tony. He was also the first on my list, but he's the last on my list too. Thanks, uh, John. Just just to come back and um, say, you know, if, there, if there's any further support, perhaps that we, the board, can offer Sam and Louise, um, then you know, obviously, I'm sure we'd all be delighted to to do that. Uh, and, and the last is a request, Jonathan, uh, perhaps to you, um, and. It's whether we could maybe have a look at this again in a year's time and, and look at progress and uh, see how such an example has been embedded uh, in care. Sam's answering that question by the look of it because your hand's gone up, Sam. I will. So um, today is not only International Nurses Day, which I can't not mention. So thank you for my colleagues for joining and um, not needing me at all. It's been very easy paper to present. <laughs> thank you to you guys. Um, but we're also launching our nursing with Wifery strategy and part of the delivery plan will be improvement around this area. So we'd be delighted to come back um, and feedback our improvements against the trajectory. Thanks, Sam. And uh, uh, it's great that we have more nurses than usual on this call for International Nurses Day. Um, I'm sure that's not entirely coincidental, um, but uh, uh, it's a great way of celebrating that we can see the innovation the reflection and the, the circle being closed, so actually our patients get better care because of the way we reflect uh, on their experiences. Um, so that was a fantastic patient story. Um, thank you very much, uh, Heather, Natasha and Louise for joining us and answering the questions on that, because um, it's really helpful to the board to get a sense of how these things actually get done uh, as opposed to just seeing the papers. So it's, it's great to see you and thank you very much. However, I should move the agenda on, I think, from that point. So uh, uh, thanks very much to uh, all of you. And I should move us to the integrated performance report. Uh, and as always, we're going to so always, as our recent practice is, uh, rather than inviting our executive colleagues to summarise what they think we might want to ask them about, um, we're going to um, just open up the uh, floor for comments and questions to explore the uh, what we learned from into the uh, IPR and as is commonly the case Katie's finger got to the button quicker than anybody else's Katie. 
Yes, it's uh, IT fingers, I'm sorry. Um, so I have a couple of questions for David. Um, now, there are a couple of things that make me slightly anxious in the, in the IPR, David. One of, them, one of them is the fact that there are quite a lot of um, security and protection breaches. That's one thing. Perhaps you just comment on that number. 31 just makes me slightly anxious. And the other thing is there was um, an F, uh, P1 um, around a power event. And in IT, uh, power events are quite rare. And I'd just like David to comment on that as well, please. Um, absolutely. To put the, the the IT breaches in, 31 is 31 too many, um, Katie, but 31 is not an unexpectedly high number of an organisation our size with the millions of transactions we take place. Um, the, of the 31, only one was a level one incident, um, which means we've reported it to the, to the ICO. We're still waiting the feedback for the investigation on that, but um, for reassurance, um, out of the um, items that were reported to the ICO next year, of which there was a handful, certainly less than a dozen from memory, not one has resulted in any action um, from the ICO. And the incident in March, which was reported, was with regards to a discharge summary being sent um, to a patient's GP, despite them requesting that it wasn't. Um, so it was a process question rather than any sort of data breach. So yeah, 31 is too high. We, we'll, we'll keep a monitor on it, but I'm not unduly concerned by that level with the amount of transactions we take place. The power um, question is a very good question. Um, so the incident in the level zero essentially was that we didn't have uh, dual power feeds into the kit. We only had one direct power and then one via the um, UPS, the, the, the battery backup. Um, and that's to do with the phase three, the, the phasing of the electricity down there meant that we couldn't actually have them both into the kit at that point in time. The issue was that the UPS kicked into place. It's an unexpected power disruption. The UPS kicked in, which was all against plan. However, the alerts weren't sent from the UPS to say that it kicked in. So no one was aware that we were running on redundant power as opposed to mains, which was a failure in the UPS monitoring. So we have taken remedial action against that. And we are now working with the states with regards to establishing whether we can, um, if there's a way across the phase in to have dual um, power into that kit as well. So it is highlighted an area of strengthening um, required in, on level zero. OK, and just to follow up quickly, David, what risk does it place us under, do you think? Um, well, well, from a likelihood perspective, this is a th this is the first time that there's been a power cut of this type there. That's not to say power cuts don't happen, obviously. Um, so I would say the likelihood has slightly increased until I can get redundant power into the into the kit. But the impact hasn't because the impact is 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 where it was at. I think um, I'm reassured that in the interim, now that we have the alerting on the UPS, they're multi-hour backups. Um, I d th there hasn't been any electrical downtime that would out sync the battery power as long as we were aware that we'd flipped a battery in the first place. Yes. So yes. I'm confident that this this event won't repeat. But like I say, we are working with the states to make sure that it, it doesn't happen at all. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Ash. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, mine's a more general question and it would come from me as being a pharmacist. Um, there doesn't appear to be anything in this report at all around medication errors or um, medication transfer of care, people being readmitted to hospital. And I could be just, I've just missed it, but I couldn't see anything. And given medication is the biggest intervention that we make, um, I was surprised that there's nothing in there. Who's going to pick that up? Megan, have you? Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Ash. Um, so we have two uh, metrics in the on the table on page 83 of the pack, which talk about uh, allergy reconciliation and also stage two medicines reconciliation. Uh, we've always, always had that. One performs 100 percent, the other one doesn't during particularly during the weekend. And there's a business case being supported for that to increase the staffing around the weekend. And we're looking at that in terms of the medication harm incidents. They're not reported uh, separately 
to in this uh, in this format, but are reported to the Clinical Governance Committee, where Sam and I uh, re receive a report uh, about it. Um, it is also one of our quality priorities this year uh, to look particularly at medication safety involving insulin and anticoagulants, which are the two commonest errors uh, in, in in practice. And we've also uh, last year set up a medicine safety group, um, which looks again and at um, the work related to the quality priority and over overall medication incidents. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, there's also a couple of columns on the nursing midwifery staffing safe starting dashboard which relate to medication concerns um, which we have discussed occasionally and trying to sort of correlate. Ash, what I suggest is that this is obviously something we would really welcome your um, discussions with Megna and Sam and any ideas on what would be useful to get the high level metrics um, would be great to, to pick that up. So um, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne, you were next. OK, thank you very much. So I'm going to ask a finance question. Um, I think finance has done quite well recently in having not too many questions asked in this meeting because we've always been sort of explaining everything as a result of COVID. So I just wanted to ask a question and maybe it, it I think it probably needs to be taken out of the room. But I mean, the first point I just wanted to make was on page 81, which is the summary of where we are at month 12, obviously subject to audit against the forecast. That's a very helpful and easy to understand summary. And obviously the final outcome is also very pleasing against the forecast. So I just wanted to say that first, but then I moved over to page 82 and I really struggled in the analysis against plan. And I know plan for all the reasons we know is actually not um, is not what we've been monitoring ourselves against recently because of all the changes that we've been going through over the last year. But I really struggled to understand the pay variance, for example, and maybe some of the others as well, where we're saying the adverse variance is 57.4 million. Um, and then we talk about 18.7 million of that being to do with COVID, but it doesn't fully, ex it obviously doesn't explain what the rest of the items are. I mean, and I know there are a whole load of things in terms of the way num the numbers are presented where we've got costs and then we've got revenue sometimes as well. So I don't know whether Jason um, would, would be able to give me a just like a one liner or a two liner of um, of the, the the rest of that variance. I mean, I know agency costs and so on may well be part of it, but I don't know whether they're included in the COVID variance or not. So, so it's really, is there a quick way to give me a sort of snapshot on that? Or is it something that we probably ought to take outside the meeting? Thank you, Anne. Good question. And we're about to find out whether there's a quick way. Jason. So apologies, Anne, and indeed the whole board. Um, there's a longer explanation on page 87 and um, my error, I didn't pull forward one salient fact through to the summary. The other significant issue, uh, and I'm looking to correct this in this year's budget, is that we don't plan for DH's central contribution for the increase in staff pensions from 14 to 20 percent. Um, and that is um, about £27 million. Um, uh, we don't get notified till quite late in the day that it's happening, but it's happened two years in a row now. And I was thinking when I looked at this report that actually it might be easier if I just instructed my team in, in this year's plan to just put one twelfth of that in every month and that in the full year number, because we might be out by a few hundred thousand pounds on what it actually comes in in, but it would actually make the actual to plan variance, um, you know, materially right. So yes, apologies, and that that rather large number, which is there's a um, uh, there's a better breakdown on page eighty seven, could should have been in page eighty one because it's. When you add the COVID and that together, while there are a few other things going on, it, it, it makes the sort of the variance much more comprehensible. Thank you, Jason. That's really helpful. And I did, of course, know about the pensions variance, but I'd forgotten about it when I was reading page. Well, I, I didn't I didn't make it easy to find, so apologies. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne, and for that response, Jason. Uh, Tony. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, First of all, I, I 
was really pleased to see that wherever possible, it's, it's uh, good to see OUH compared to our peers. Uh, and I think that gives us a real understanding of where we are with things. So that, that that's really helpful. I had um, two questions for, first of all, about 52 waiters, 52 week waiters, and then a question about radiology. So the 52 week waiters, the surgical ones are, I think, prioritized um, according to the Royal College. Uh, and I just wondered, once the clinicians actually see the patients in the uh, clinic, um, are they able then to audit the, that process? Although it's a recommendation from the Royal College, it can be refined and it's a way of learning from that to see how accurate that, that works and whether anyone slips through the net. And the second question relating to that is, what do we do about the non-surgical 52 week waiters um, that appear on the list? And then the separate radiology question is, I noticed do, that the... Do you want to do them in sequence, Tony? Okay. Should we take yeah. that first one first and then come back? Who's going to answer it? So I'll, make it, I'll make a start on the um, RCS. So the, uh, the Royal College uh, prioritisation, Tony, is to do with the surgical waiting list, which is, is a waiting list right from actually just, it isn't just a 52 weeks, it's the whole of the waiting list. So I think if you see on page um, the 57, that um, the, the, well, and so that is, I think it's around 8,000 patients altogether. So it, across all of the specialties. So, but it's not just on 52 weeks. So we capture it on, in EPR, but we don't, we're looking for um, the front end of the pathway so we can actually cap capture it from when patients um, come in from the outpatient. So we're still looking for that technical solution. We haven't yet audited that process, but it's something that well, I can, we can take away, I can discuss with Megana and the harm review process of that, that auditing, but certainly, um, and link it into the harm review process, but we can, we can do that. Um, so in so and the non geometrical the non surgical the non surgical fifty two weeks are, are captured in the harm review process. So and that that's particularly that captures everybody over fifty two weeks. So that comes out into the the quality um, part of the report. Megan, you wanted to add something to that? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say that um, we've had a Shelford um, CMO group meeting, inviting other uh, colleagues to the call, um, uh, really about a, an event looking at harm reviews amongst the, all the Shelford group organisations. And uh, we've since also, I've since had conversations with James Kent and the CMOs at Reading and Bucks uh, as well. And really the consensus is that the the, pri the prioritization, the P1 to P4, should be done at the point of entry into the system, such as at, at clinic, when it's decided that somebody should be on the waiting list, uh, surgical waiting list, uh, that we should continue doing the 104 week harm reviews for cancer patients systematically as they always happen. Um, but there's also perhaps uh, a need to uh, contact patients who have been uh, waiting uh, longer, uh, either by text or by letter. Um, and then followed up by a call so that we don't miss people who have not been able to respond to the text or letter, etc. And we are trying to create a, a system that is joint up uh, at the ICS level. And we talked about this yesterday at Execs, and uh, we're going to put in a uh, develop an SOP which actually explains um, and and is very clear in terms of the wording in the text and the letter uh, to um, hear back from patients as well. Uh, and, and so it's a sort of a multi-pronged approach uh, as the numbers uh, are, are very high, as we all know. Thank you very much. Tony, does that answer question one? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Um, so the, the radiology numbers, of course, are, are going up and, and we can understand in part why, it, why this is. But I just wondered, is this a human issue? That is to say, just so many more patient referrals or is it a human issue in terms of radiographers and radiologists available? Or is it a machine issue that we simply don't have enough machines um, to do the imaging? Or all of the above? So I think, um, I'm so sorry. 
Jim, is it okay for me to answer? So if we look at the diagnostic uh, weights, which is on page 54, so that I think you're that's the you're looking at those DMO1 results, which is primarily the biggest weights have that increased people there, Tony, are the MRI um, 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 areas. And we are undergoing, which I think we've reported to the board, uh, an MRI replacement programme. We've got fem, um, seven magnets. We've re we've replaced three. Three. We've um, in the progress. We're in the process of, of replacing two more, um, and we've got another one starting within uh, the West Wing later, and then another, another one for to Churchill. So we're going through that process. We have had some unexpected downtime because we've got old kits throughout this time, and that's part of the issues that we've had. So, um, so that's one issue, and we have do have workforce issues. We have we have a replace. Uh, we have an additional. Um, we've looked for and have got additional capacity within our independent sector, and we've got a number of contracts to support that additional need, mm -hmm. so that we don't lose any capacity whilst we're in the middle of that replacement program. There is also a quite a robust um, workforce plan in recruitment of radiographers. We have got some particular problematic areas for radiographers as we've reported within that perhaps, perhaps breasts the mammographers are a particular issue for recruitment both nas nationally as well so we're working on that workforce piece does that help answer the question yes thanks thanks very much tony and sarah uh, paula is next on the list and then it'll be sarah horton thank you um i just wanted to stay on the topic of the 52 week weights and just reflect firstly on page 53 that it was really good to see the the total number decreasing for the first time so the graph plateauing for want of a better way of putting it um i wouldn't be complacent about that in any way what i would really love to hear from one of the team is the take on how we are getting on and whether we are getting on top of this what they're what they're seeing i.e I, an interpretation of this um because it, it was great to see it was the first time for a long time um but i wonder whether you're feeling how you're feeling about our progress so if, if i may chair perhaps take the first lead on that and um, others might want to answer so certainly we have actually seen a significant increase in activity uh paula since um the really march and into april so we we haven't got the final details obviously for april but overall we're at, we are seeing a significant increase in activity We've done a lot of work in terms of the planning um, around and, and um, working with divisions about what activity we can put through our capacity in line with our workforce, but really mindful of uh, making sure that our real focus is on rest and recovery and that growing stronger programme for our staff is real priority. But we really make sure that we're absolutely utilising the capacity that we currently got, whether that's within our patients or, or theatres. I think the particular issue for us is that we've got some high volume specialties, so we have got some insourcing um, support in terms of our ENT, so additional outpatient capacity at weekends and, and, and also inpatient support. We are very focused um, on that clinical prioritisation. So as we see on that page we've just talked about with Tony, where we looked at the RCS. So particularly those patients are uh, P2, so those patients that need to be done within four weeks. There's around, um, so at, 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 um, just now I looked at the numbers for, for, for last week, um, about 1,200 in total at P2s. There's about now 500 outside of the four weeks. So we're really concentrating on making sure that those pet patients are brought into that four week time scale so they're not outside that priority, that urgent priority category. We're also ex um, talking to colleagues at Reading to see if they can help support us in a couple of urology specialties to do with those two P2 categories and also hysteroscopies so that we can look at how we can manage the capacity across the wider Bob ICS. So can colleagues help us? So we're all at the same sort of level of capacity and demand for those particularly P2 two, two patients, if you like. Does that help? It does. I guess I'm wondering whether we think we're getting on top. I know how much work you've been putting in and it's really it, evident and it was so nice to see the graph. I just was trying to get a personal take really. 
So we are, we, we certainly I can see a drop in uh, the numbers from when we first reported 50 to 52 weeks, but out of those four, four, four weeks, so we're 660 at the end of March, they're 572 at the, at the 10th of May. So we're also seeing a drop in um, patients um, over, over uh, 52 weeks as well. So we can see quite starting to see quite a significant drop. And the patients over 104 day, uh, 104 weeks, were down to 19. We're down to 19. So they are coming down. So it's, um, but so it's a bit, probably a bit slow at the moment. But we are making a headway in the right direction. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Magna, did you want um, to come on that? Thank you, Chair. I was just going to respond from the theatre's perspective, uh, Paula, um, to say that we are uh, we last week of April we were back at 491 lists in that week. This is against a baseline of pre-COVID baseline of about 390 to 400, and during COVID baseline of about. 100, if you can imagine, because we had to stop several times. Um, and we've completed in that week almost almost 900 to 1,000 cases. So we are, we are working um, in a very um, uh, sort of collaborative manner in the th at the Theatre Productivity Steering Group. There's lots of good things coming out of it, and that's demonstrated by the increase in activity um, across the piece. That's really great to hear. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Sarah. Sarah Horton. Thank you. So um, Anne's asked my finance question. I, I do think there's a piece around pulling the finance performance for the full year into a bit more focus um, and not losing it just in the back of the IPR at some point. So perhaps Jonathan could think about how we pick that up in a bit more detail. I think it, it warrants a proper discussion. Um, and then just to follow up, and I'm sorry, Sarah, it's yet more on your on your waiting times. I think you know, you're doing an amazing job around the recovery, and I think it's really important that we're protecting protecting the team as well. Um, but just on the breast cancer weights, um, I saw that you were sort of getting on top of it, and now it's got back out to the the sort of over over three week wait for people. Is there anything the system can do to help us with that? As people are obviously coming out of the woodwork. Um, so um, what I can report into uh, that you don't have at the moment. So the um, the, the numbers for um, for, um, for for March have improved on the two week wait. So we have slightly gone up by 0.8%, 72.8% for March and best symptomatic have gone up to 44.1%. So not where we want to be, but you can actually see quite a significant jump on that breast. So we we are still um, we met meeting weekly with the breast team, both with the the actual surgical team and also the um, radiographers, so that we can work through that. We have asked Thames Valley for Cancer Alliance for additional support. Um, we and we've spoken to RBH. So I think if we recall at one of the board meetings, we talked about having connected clinics that we see the patients get all the tests completed in that time and then the patient goes home with the diagnosis there and then um, and that's what we've been working to um, rbh could offer some disjointed clinics where patients could be seen without that um, diagnostic facility so we're now also looking at that because we need to ensure that we can get this increase of patients um, throughput and, and to, in a timely way to see if we can actually we'll have to look at dis disconnecting the clinics so we can see patients in in the time frame so we're just working with that the main issue is around staffing for us for, and uh, we're looking at now independent sector support around mammographers is the particular issue for us. Um, so, and that that is a rate limiting step. And that we've been at nationally, we've been out to agency, we've had we've been a, a number of different places. We've looked at other trusts around us. So, um, and for, as further field as, as Thames Valley Cancer Alliance, and also benchmarked with other trusts. So. Um, it is a national issue around um, mammographers and um, and uh, so we're, we're just working through that. Thanks. Uh, okay, good to hear that it's heading in the right direction. Thanks, Sarah. Um, can I just pick up on the, the financial sort of monitoring uh, oversight challenge? I think this is 
particularly tricky because of the amount of things that have been abnormal during COVID and it's tricky because of the work that's going on at ICS level and we'll have a an opportunity in confidential business to try and take stock of where things are at the ICS um, uh, level. Um, I wondered Bruno whether I might just invite you before I hand over to, to Jason just to say a little bit about what you've been briefing me on around the pulling together of the operational data, the workforce planning, the, the finance, and how much further into the organisation you feel TMA has been able to get uh, in this cycle, because I'm, I've am i been encouraged by the briefings, Bruno, you've been giving me that that we're beginning to get to the stage where we could, could get a much more robust sightline on it at, at board. So Bruno, and then I'll hand over to Jason. Bruno, are you with us? Sorry, Jonathan, I was called away. Bruno, I was just asking you to to briefly comment on what you were briefing me about last week, about the way in which you, you feel that the, the sidelines on the finances are reaching further into the divisions and the clinical directorates in terms of pulling together the operational, the workforce planning, the, the financial bits that, that we've been able in previous cycles. Um, and uh, I want to give some confidence to the board that we hope to be able to bring that back to people. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, no, that, that's that's fine. And um, I think we're indeed making uh, good progress and uh, have support of uh, some of the corporate uh, departments um, uh, which are reporting to different executives uh, around workforce planning, uh, demand uh, forecasting, uh, capacity uh, planning, and how it all then ties into the financial uh, framework. Um, uh, this still, I mean, we were talking about this still will take quite some time to link up all of these different work streams because the trust uh, used to plan in the past quite in silos. Uh, there was a demand uh, capacity model, there was a workforce model, and then a financial model, but they were running uh, uh, sort of separate from each other and not really interlinked. I think we're making good progress on making sure that they are linked, uh, but it uh, it is still work in progress. And I can probably tell the board that the, um, the, the sort of triangulation between um, demand capacity, workforce and finance uh, is certainly happening at divisional level and at clinical directorate level. Uh, but not yet at service level. Service level meaning, uh, do we know, for example, how many uh, theatre sessions are allocated to cataract surgery? Um, and therefore, how many cataracts do we expect to be, um, to be performing? And is that being checked yeah, in terms of the, um, the staffing uh, availability? We're not yet at that level, but we're definitely doing a better triangulation at the divisional and clinical directorate level. Thanks, Jason. Uh, you know, Jason put his hand up as well. Jason. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I, I suspect that actually we need both what Bruno's just been discussing, but but um, I'm just looking at Anne's comment in the chat and sort of my interpretation of what Sarah said. I think there's also an opportunity um, to take a slightly more measured look back on the whole year than sort of the, the review of the, the IPR uh, does. Um, uh, and there's a couple of opportunities with that actually, which, which are quite easy to, to do. One is there's a detailed commentary on the accounts and the numbers in the accounts that the audit committee get. And with a little bit of, of attention on making it sort of fit for the board, of course, that could come to the special board meeting that signs off uh, the accounts so that um, uh, that more detailed uh, information on the financial performance uh, is seen by a wider set of board members. But the, the other thing that I could do quite easily um, um, is I, I maintain a document, my team maintain a document for me, which look is a multi-year trend analysis year on year of our income and expenditure, our workforce and activity. Um, I'm board, longer serving board members will have seen it once or twice in the past, as it were, um, and actually at either the June IAC or the July board, I just need to sort of talk to colleagues about how quickly we could put some decent narrative around it. 
it would actually be it may be that Sarah's question might be better served not by sort of uh, understanding why um, accounts payable have moved by X um, uh, between last year and this year, but more by me showing the board um, the latest version of that multi year trend analysis with some commentary, because I suspect that I'm putting words into Sarah's um, um, mouth. It's more that strategic view of what if you look at the whole year, it's telling us um, that she's interested in probably not than sort of why accounts payable moved, but maybe both. We're going to find out, Sarah. Is that what he suspects? Does he suspect correctly? Uh, I think. I think actually it is both. So I think that I think absolutely setting it in the context of the trend, and particularly as we move forward. So understanding, you know, what that trend means as we move into the new universe, um, and in light of the, the information coming out of the financial review as well. But I do also think there's a good discipline in in just talking through the where we actually landed in the full year properly in a reasonable degree of um detail just so that we've you know it ties to the, the like full year end accounts but i think it just there's a lot of work that goes into this we talked it through a lot on the way into landing the full year so i think it just deserves a kind of actually okay where did we finally come to what does that mean for how we how we think about next year um conversation so i think we should agree sarah in our business cycle we should always create that space to reflect on the the year end and we'll perhaps work out about the best timing and the way to do that when we've uh, had the audited accounts we've got the financial governance review in this cycle and we can pull those things together but we should agree that there's a it's part of our annual cycle that we take that stock i think that would be good i see lots of nods to that so um is there um I have Anne and I do have a couple of questions myself and let Anne ask the very same questions when I get there. So Anne. OK, thank you. Well, I agree with all that on finance and it was sort of a bit behind my original question. So thank you for that. That's not the point I'm going to raise. I'm going to ask about um, data security training because I noticed that we finished the year at 79 percent and I know for the toolkit return that we have to um, return by the end of June, we need to get to 95% and I know this is always a focus um, and I also know that Bruno sent a note out not so long ago um, encouraging everybody to actually get on and do this but the actual level of completion has stayed roughly around the same and it, it did dip in January and went up to 79% so I just wondered whether we were confident that we were going to get back up to the 95% and I do acknowledge obviously that the new limb system is now up and running and I've actually used it myself so I know it works and it's relatively easy to use um, so I just wanted to comment really on where we thought we were going to be with that data security and um, training. David? Um. David or Terry, I don't know who's the. Best well, I'll, I'll take it from a from a specific IG training point, but I think the the challenge is probably more around the Statman um, training. I think it is unlikely that we'll achieve ninety five percent compliance um, in time for the submission, and I think therefore we would be um, non compliant with the toolkit on current trajectory. Um, so that's unusual, David, isn't it? Because we do normally get there in the end. Yeah, we do normally get that and we may well still do. Um, and obviously there's always a trough here with IG training um, with a lot of the annual training. People do it sometimes at the, you know, in month 12. So there's there's sometimes a lag in 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 catch up and, and through the year. I, it is a significant challenge um, with regards to this. We do we do undertake triangulation. So we're coming back to the 31 IG breaches earlier. None of those 31 IG breaches included anyone that hadn't completed their IG training. Um, but that said, that we we should be at ninety five percent. It shouldn't be an optional. We do we've explored options um, such as um, disabling accounts and access. But of course, actually, we're penalising the patient there rather than the individual if we're denying them access to the the clinical system. So I think there is a broader conversation still to have within the trust with regards to our compliance against all statutory and mandatory training. And of course, and we will continue to push. We will send floor walkers around. I will send people in during the night with laptops to do the training. We'll be very proactive. Um, but actually, we need to make it cultural. It shouldn't be something we have to push for to do a, a training to, to, to take an audit requirement. It should just be part of our contractual responsibilities. So uh, before I hand over to Terry, my one of my questions related a bit to the interpretation of the graphs on page 63, where there's a little upturn in terms of non-medical appraisal and stat man, but 
it's not clear whether we think that that is a, a trend um, and it, it remains a challenge for us. So Terry, perhaps you could also give a comment on whether you think we have seen a, a sort of COVID plateau and we are going to make more inroads into this um, as well as answering Anne's question. Terry. Yeah, so uh, I, I would agree we have seen um, over over time, especially when it when we come around to the different um, peaks that we've had in relation to COVID, we have seen that compliance with um, STAM as as well as appraisals has has dropped over over time, and it's actually something that uh, when you look at the integrated performance report uh, that you know we've recognised and we we are focusing on. Um, I do think that there will be there will be an increase and that we will be able to um, um, push this up, but it's actually dependent on a number of different factors. Um, one is a new system that we've implemented and put in place. There are still some teething problems which we're, which we're working through to make sure that actually everything has transferred through effectively and that everybody knows how to utilise the system, the system well. But once that's embedded, I'm expecting us to see a, a steady, a steady increase um, uh, across all of our statutory mandatory uh, um, training. But on top of that, I do think that once we've got all of the system issues sorted, um, I, I think there is some further work we need to do in terms of uh, performance managing uh, um, you know, divisions and ourselves, corporate, uh, um, to make sure that everybody is uh, is complying and knows the importance of of delivery so i'm expecting to see an increase i'm not expecting to see that increase um in april but i'm expecting to see it around you know few months into around the in quarter two i'm expecting to see to see an increase uh, and that combined with the performance management at divisional performance review uh, i think we will be able to move forward on this I think so. Before I go back to Anne, Claire, your hand came up and it may be related to that. Claire? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, yes, um, I was going to sort of ask the same question as, as you did on Statman training and appraisal. And just to make the comment, really, that because our levels have been historically low, I think we've got to be careful not to attribute too much of the reduction we've seen recently to COVID and really understand what was going on um, in the long term, which I know you're going to try and do, Terry. So just to support, you know, your comments on that. And and the other thing I just wanted to say is well done on sepsis, because I know I've been going on about this for many months now, but we're getting really close, aren't we, to being to being able to hit the target. And do we think that that's sustainable? Thank you, Claire. Um, it's actually hit 100 percent in March. Um, <laughs> is it sustainable? Uh, I very much hope so, because we created uh, change to processes and systems and not just uh, not just sort of about training people. So it's not individual based. So I, I guess that gives uh, us um, a great opportunity to make it sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne, I don't think that was the end of your question. So what's another one? No, that was it. I, I'd also spotted sepsis as well. So there we go. But just back to the statutory mandatory training. I mean, I think the point Claire makes is, is very valid. I mean, it, it has been a challenge for us for a long time to get these numbers up. And, and I know there's been discussion in the past about whether the, the classifications of what's what's mandatory are correct and so on. So I just, you know, I just like, I mean, I, the answer, we don't have the answer now, but, you know, as Terry um, sort of focuses on this, maybe we'll get a, a better feel of what we actually need to do to get these levels up to the right level. We, um, we do, I think, have an indication from Terry about the point at which we have a close look at it. So if Terry is thinking that we may see something in April, then we should have a look in May, June. To, uh, so w when those figures come through to ask whether that has given us a suggestion. So perhaps Terry, you and I could check on at what point should the board have a look at whether the things that you have been doing are delivering the changes that that you're anticipating because we we don't want to discuss that prematurely we want to discuss it when we, when we're talking about something useful terry 
Yes, um, I agree. Some of the actions that we've actually started to take, uh, which we've agreed through TME, is, is our new uh, um, STAM and appraisal policy and what we're going to include, what we're not going to include, uh, um, and how we're going to uh, classify what our score, core skills training is. Um, and every month, um, what we what I do in the in the integrated performance report is highlight specifically what we're doing and and how and what our trajectory is. So I can go into more detail on that um, every time we meet at board. Thank you. Um, OK, I would like to ask a question um, before we leave, and then I think we should get a break uh, uh, because I think people have earned that and clear the minds and we'll move on to the other issues. Um, it relates to the bank and agency spend on page 68 uh, of the IPR um, and the narrative explains why we have a big change uh, in the final bit but it doesn't really tell me what the underlying risk is and what we would expect to see going forward so I don't need any further explanation I think of, of why that graph does what it does but I would like to uh, understand what I should expect to see in the next one and what this tells us about the the underlying challenges you know so if a lot of late invoices have come in and the level is going to be higher going forward that's different from if actually it averages out and won't make much difference because it covers a long period so Jason can you help me with that thank you chair yes so um the narrative is correct exactly and we've done quite a lot of work on this we've always found actually and again some longer serving board members will know that when we run bank incentive schemes although we push out some very strong messages and processes for everyone to claim the incentives on time there tends to be a lag um and um it our judgment is almost always the case that we have either a legal requirement to pay the staff or it's simply not worth the bad will that be engendered by not paying people who'd missed the deadline to claim an incentive for what hours they'd actually worked. And you see this in the last quarter, but at a slightly greater scale because the scale of incentive was larger. What I can tell the board is I have been monitoring the number of bank and agency shifts worked per week. And in April, it's rapidly come down um, to sort of below the Q4 levels. So when we see the bank cost data for April, we should see a resumption of the underlying trend. And you, you could you could implicitly draw a sort of smoothed line for Q4 of the 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 um, January, February, and, and March spike sort of smoothed, and expect to see in March, expect to see in April um, a fairly uh, uh, rapid decline in in spend. So I guess it would be quite nice to sort of see what the what the trend line looks like uh, on that, so that we understand what what it leads uh, overall. Um, Sam, and then I'm going to take a break. Thank you, Chair. So it's just a really quick point, but I think it's pertinent that um, the exec are really focusing around um, e rostering compliance, um, strengthening controls. And there's also that piece of triangulation. It is in the narrative, but the fill rate went up by 27%, which is a really good thing. Um, so I think that we could probably, I mean, it is in the narrative, um, but there is also a focus on e-rostering controls that we've brought into the performance reviews this month. So just wanted to mention Thanks, that. Sam. That's good to hear. Um, I think we should now break. We're behind schedule by about quarter of an hour, but we have done a bit longer on the CQC than we expected to do up front. We thought we might need to do that in AOB. Um, Megan, uh, will you let Rob know that we um, will take a 10 minute break now, start again at 10.45. Um, uh, hopefully that'll be okay for Rob, will it, Megan? I, I should think so. I think Katie has arranged with him, so we'll contact him. Thank you, Chair, no problem. Just checking, Anne, your hand's still up, but I think we dealt with your questions. That's Kate. Okay. So we will reconvene at 10.45 and uh, give everyone a chance to get a comfort break and a caffeine or tannin infusion.